Well, we'll go ahead and we'll get started. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to our fifth and last seminar in our series on evaluating the news. Um, if you've been here for the, for the whole ride, I appreciate it. Um, but uh, again, it'll, it'll be on our YouTube channel um, uh, going forward here. And I hope we're able to tie together the different things we've talked about uh, over the last few weeks um, to give you some uh, ideas and ways of thinking that will help you as you encounter um, the news in, in, your, in your personal life. So before we begin, here's a, a, a thinking experiment. Think about the news you consume on a daily and a weekly basis. What is its tone? How does it make you feel emotionally and motivationally? Where does it come from? And then secondly, what do you think it means to be a conscientious consumer of news? Ultimately, who is responsible for what you decide to take in? And how can you draw attention to truth without being partisan? That's a tough one, if there are perceptions there. And how do you avoid yellow journalism tactics, both in what you consume and in what you share? And so uh, we had mentioned when we first talked about yellow journalism, uh, how before Joseph Pulitzer and, and William Randolph Hearst, uh, reporting on the government was very dry. And so um, here's from the New Ulm Review in 1878. Um, I just wanted to, to take a look here at um, the section here on, uh, on Congress. Here we go. And this is what um, political reporting used to be like. Senate, January 28th. The morning hour was mostly taken up in presenting petitions. The House bill to remove obstructions in the Mississippi, Missouri, Missouri and Arkansas rivers was passed. The House bill regulating purchases by the public printer was concurred in. Bills were introduced and referred. The Bland bill was taken up, and Mr. Morrill spoke in opposition to it, adjourned. So it's pretty straightforward, right? It just says this is what happened. Um, there's no evaluation. There's no analysis. There's no emotional language. It's just a report of uh, like meeting minutes, and, and that's what it was like before you know, sensationalism happened. So our topics for today are what does it mean to be news literate? Um, it's the point of, of, this, of this series. How can you practice news literacy? How can you share news literacy? And then we'll do some practicing of our own. So uh, getting started, remember we uh, earlier had defined news literacy as the knowledge and skills to identify, analyze, evaluate, and decide for oneself the nature, intent, and consequence of news. And so first I'd like to start with, to be news literate, what is it that you need to know? And this is going to be kind of a review of things we've talked about. So first, metacognitive thinking, that idea of being able to think about what you are thinking and feeling. Because when news is presented to us, we all have some sort of initial response in our thoughts, in our feelings, depending on the way it is presented. And that can depend on the words that are used, the visuals that are used, the voice of the person presenting it, if it's something with audio. Um, all of those come into play in the way that we create an initial judgment of a piece of information. And so it's very important that we're able to identify what that judgment is and think about why we came to that conclusion so fast. What brought us there? Um, and so learning to examining your own emotional responses, recognizing your evaluating thoughts. And so that means looking at our confirmation bias. Do we have an initial judgment about a piece of information because we already agree with it, right? Um, because of 
uh, a belief that we have, an opinion that we hold, uh, because of personal experience, whatever it might be. Um, looking at the assumptions and perspective blinders that we have. Uh, it's, sometimes it's real easy in, in our own bubbles to think that everybody around us either feels exactly the same as we do or the polar opposite of what we do, right? And, and neither of those are really true. Um, but when we have these initial evaluating thoughts, our brain does that all the time. And we have to learn to recognize that and think about how do we look at something more closely without falling into that trap. And then also thinking about our own prejudices and opinions. Um, so if, if I read an article that talks about the health benefits of tapioca, I'm not really going to pay attention to it because I don't like tapioca. Um, right? That is my own opinion and prejudice, partly from personal experience, unfortunately. Um, but um, you know, we all have those um, because none of us is the same person. Uh, we all have things that we like and dislike. We've all had different experiences, positive and negative, with different situations. And so those play into the way we perceive things. And so learning to recognize and own those is an important skill because if you can't recognize those, it makes it very difficult to have real honest communication with people you don't agree with. Um, separating fact from opinion. Remember that facts have context. If you're presented with a piece of information but no context for it, you have no way to verify it. And so you can't call that a fact. Determining if something is logically valid. Which means that we have to be identifying any fallacies um, in the way that things are presented. And remembering the journalistic process and ethical standards that we looked at last week. Um, that process of collecting information, editing, writing, and presenting. Um, and those standards of acting independently and... Um, you're making sure that we're minimizing harm. And so when you look at a piece of information, these are the things that you think about as you go into that. Now, I'm not saying you go through this whole large thinking process every time you read a news article. But when you come across a, a news article that you can tell is trying to persuade you to do something, or that maybe challenges an assumption that you had, then this is a very helpful thing to be able to do. And, and as I mentioned earlier, um, copies of this slide and the next slide are, are available as a note sheet over there. OK, so now that we've talked about what we need to know, let's think about what do you need to do. Well, first of all, you have to ask questions. If you are not asking questions, then you're not really thinking about it. Um, you can always start with the five W's because if you're presented something but it's missing some of those, that's the most basic place to start so that you can determine what really is, is going on with this piece of information. If your friend calls you up and says, yeah, I heard there was some kind of conflict going on over in some country in Eastern Europe or it sounds really bad, that's very generalized, and it doesn't really give you any specifics. So you could look it up and say, OK, it's a conflict between Russia and Ukraine, and this is what it's about, and this is when it's happening, and where it's happening, and, and talking about the why is the difficult part, right? Um, but those are a good place to start. And then we need to question intent. Um, and we've talked about this a, a bit as we've gone through the series. Is this piece of information that's being shared with me, is it designed to entertain? You know, is it supposed to make me laugh or cry or feel happy or that's a really cute puppy, whatever it might be, right? Um, is it intended to persuade? Is it trying to get me to agree with the writer or speaker um, or to go forth with some course of action? Right? Or is it intended to inform? Is this just information and I get to decide what I do with it? I like recipe books for that reason. Now, of course, some recipe books are written in a very conversational style and the 
you know, the, the author of the book will say, I love this recipe because of this and this. But the recipe itself, you know, is, he can't really mess that up in terms of information-wise, right? Um, as long as it's complete. <laughs> look for assumptions. Um, and, and there are two broad categories of assumptions you look for when someone is presenting you with information. First of all, judgments about the topic. You can look for those emotionally charged words. You can look for um, affirmation or negation of a particular uh, perspective. Um, and then judgments about their audience. Uh, remember, you can learn a lot about um, a presenter based on who they assume you are, right? Um, the way that they talk to you, the information they choose to include or not include, and the words that they use tell a lot about who they think they are talking to, um, which can tell you a lot about, again, what is their intent. Um, so it's something uh, important to consider. And then you gotta verify the information. Um, look for other articles by the same author. How do they compare in subject matter, style, tone, and intent? Is this a person that writes about the same topic a lot? Um, is it something that, is, is it a person who changes their style based upon what they're writing about? Are all of the things that they share really angry? Um, uh, are all the things they share just for entertainment? Um, look for other perspectives on the same topic and think about how do they differ and why. Um, you know, going back to my earlier example of Ukraine and Russia, there are a lot of perspectives going into this. You have people in Ukraine um, with a number of different perspectives. You have people in Russia with a number of different perspectives. You have countries in Eastern Europe, countries in Western Europe. Um, you've got uh, Turkey is now involved in, in diplomatic talks. Um, and, and there's all these different pieces that all have their own perspectives and things that they want out of the situation. Um, and so, just looking at it from one perspective won't help you understand all of the different parts that are, are going into this. And then, I, I, I've repeated this quite a few times, look for what is missing. Is something taken out of context or omitting a key piece of information? Anytime you have a quote, if there's no citation for it or way for you to see the entire context of what is being said, um, then that is questionable uh, because people can take parts of what is said to suit their purposes um, if they take it out of context or leave out key bits of information. And then sometimes people will omit things entirely because that's not what they want you to focus on, even though it may change your perspective on the topic at hand. Uh, and so always think about what's missing. Okay, now this is probably a reason why many people have come to this, this series is because, uh, especially online, there seems to be a lot of conflict uh, with people with different ideas and, and perspectives and opinions. And so I think, first of all, it's important to recognize that it is impossible to please 100% of the people 100% of the time. It just cannot be done. Anyone who's dealt with a two-year-old knows this is true, right? Um, you just can't. Uh, and so um, don't expect that you can. Um, we sometimes like to think of ourselves as problem solvers, um, that um, you know, we, we can convince people, we can make this right. Um, and ultimately, you only really have control over yourself. Um, and so recognize that people will have differences in perspective and opinion. And admit that that's okay. Um, now, think that differences are often cast in an oppositional framework. Um, and people make money off of this, right? Because it's entertainment. We talked about breads and circuses. People watched people fighting to the death for entertainment because of the conflict, right? And let them not think about their own problems. And so you have 
news media interviews that are set up very antagonistically and are attacking the person um, who, is, who is brought on to the newscast. Uh, and you have that very much partisan us versus them mentality. And remember, going back to judgments that the presenter is making, they want you to assume that that is true, that it is either this or that. And remember, that's a fallacy. And a lot of times that's either stereotyped by extreme positions or polar opposites, saying all these people are this way, or anyone who believes this is this type of person. And that's not true. Some examples. Science versus religion, right? Or left versus right. I happen to like both of my hands, thank you. Um, capitalism versus communism. Vegan versus carnist. I don't know too many carnists, um, uh, but uh, it's an interesting thought. So are there differences? Absolutely. You know, people have differences. But does that mean people are justified in harming others? No. Right? And so you cannot respect what you do not understand. And you cannot understand if you don't listen. And you listen when you realize that despite your differences, you have things in common. Uh, it's really easy to focus on negative things or things that are different. Um, it takes real listening, which is a skill that we have to develop in order to think about the things we have in common. Uh, when I was uh, doing my um, student teaching, uh, before I taught high school, um, one of my uh, mentor teachers told me about an experience uh, that she had with her students in middle school. And so she taught math, and she wrote 20 problems up on the board. Arithmetic should be pretty easy to, to do. And she wrote uh, answers to all 20 and purposefully wrote one of them wrong. And so after she finished writing on the board, you know, she presented it to the class, and they immediately all pointed out the one mistake she made. But then she said, yes, but I got 19 of them right. It's really easy to focus on the negative or what we see as needing fixing or, or what's wrong. But we should always start from a place of what we have in common, um, because that allows us to listen to each other in a respectful way. Okay, so when we think about evaluating the news, let's apply some logic. Um, and I'm gonna start with some assumptions because we make those all the time, but uh, you're welcome to disagree with the assumptions if you like, and, and I'm, I'm happy to, to discuss that. So assumption number one, knowing the truth is good. Can we all agree on that? Okay. Um, assumption number two, people have the right to know the truth. Can we agree on that? Well, in, in general, maybe, in some instances, you might say, well, maybe some people shouldn't know about this or that. Um, but in general, I think we can say that, that people uh, have the right to know the truth. Truth is independent of our observed opinions. Uh, whether I can see them or not with my eyes, atoms are still there. Um, whether I you know, have lived in space all my life, gravity still works. Um, that there are things that independently exist verifiably regardless of what we have seen or know. Having a perspective doesn't justify distorting or emitting information. And people that share information have an ethical responsibility to present facts in proper context. What do you think of that? Okay, so based on that framework, given the above, if an organization or article goes against one of the five principles, then it is not news. It is either censorship, propaganda, fake news, or it's just fallacious. So, what do you think? Yes, no, agree, disagree? Yeah. Um, and so 
we run into conflicts with this all the time, don't we? Um, from a variety of sources. Uh, and so as you think about the things that you need to know and do to be news literate, something to think about is, is what are your assumptions about how news should be presented to you? Um, what do you think you should be able to trust in terms of a source when it shares information with you? Um, and how can you evaluate that? Okay, so tying back a bit to people disagree. So how do you share news literacy? Um, you work on developing this knowledge and these skills. So what happens when two people can't even agree on what are the established facts? You're talking to a person or some, someone shares something with you, and you feel like they are in a completely different reality from you, right? Um, how can you communicate with that person in any sort of positive, constructive way? Um, how do you come to a respectful resolution uh, when there is that large of a disagreement? So I'm going to ask some questions, and you tell me if you think any of these work, or if you've personally tried them, feel free to share. Uh, does arguing work? No. 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 Uh, does debate work? Sometimes. Maybe for people observing the debate, but not necessarily for the people in the debate. Okay. Um, what about appeals to emotion? Does that work? Seems like it, right? Especially if we're not paying attention to fallacies, right? Um, does guilt tripping or shaming work? No. Not in any sort of healthy way, right? Uh, how about punishment? Does that work? No. No. Will sharing sources or appeals to authority work? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe, right? Um, and so, remember the definition of news literacy? you can't force another person to a conclusion because it's to decide for yourself what is, is worthy of your consumption. And so news literacy starts with asking questions. You teach by example, narrate or describe your process, and not just what you did, but what you were thinking and what questions you asked. So someone presents you with a piece of information that you don't agree with, and these things up here don't work, and say, oh, I'd like to understand where you're coming from. This is my perspective. You know, I, I heard about this same piece of news, um, and so these are the questions that I asked to help me understand the issue. And so I, I did a search this way and looked at websites, and this is how I evaluated what they said, and, and these are the conclusions I came to. Um, and so you're sharing your perspective and the things that you've learned but you're not attacking the person. You're not provoking them in any way. But you are providing them with the process you went through so that they know you're not just saying something because you feel it's that way. But they see the, whoa, oh, my plug, there we go. Um, but they see the effort and energy you put into thinking this through. Um, and that's something that people can respect. Okay, so uh, something we haven't talked about in too much detail yet, and so I thought we should cover it. Um, we did briefly talk about uh, the concept of video and audio and things like that not being very good references on the internet. Uh, because of the advancement of technology, um, things can be altered, and unfortunately frequently are. Uh, so first up, uh, how well can people spot a digitally altered photo? And some psychologists did some research on this. Uh, and so they, they put it into, uh, they divided up different ways that photos could be altered. Uh, and then looked at two different markers for people as they were looking at the photo. One, could they determine that it had been altered? And two, could they determine how and where it was altered? Um, and so that gives us four categories. They knew it was altered and they knew where and how, or they knew it was altered but couldn't tell where and how, or they weren't sure it was altered but they had an idea, or they couldn't tell at all. 
Um, and so here's what they came up with. Um, so if airbrushing was applied to something, um, you can see that not many people were very good at correctly identifying it had happened um, and where it took place. Um, anytime you see a magazine cover, um, it's almost guaranteed that that's been airbrushed in some way, right? Um, and then uh, if we look at adding or subtracting some element to the picture, that's pretty easy to see if, you know, they added something in. That's easier to, to point out and look for depending on how large it is or, or what they changed. Um, if the geometry of things have been changed, we're still not so good here. Um, it means that um, maybe something's angle has been altered slightly or its shape has been adjusted in some way. Um, if a shadow has been changed in a photo, um, that's a little bit easier to see if, it's, if the shadow is clear. And then if there's a really big change to the photo in some way, you know, people can easily identify that. But the majority of changes that are made are usually fairly subtle. And so you can see that less than half the time people got it right in a lot of these categories. Um, and so photo shows up online. Um, in your social media feed or attached, uh, unfortunately, even to a news article, um, you can't be sure that that photo has not been doctored. Um, the, uh, there is a uh, contest every year uh, for uh, photojournalists um, to present their work uh, and um, try to win a prize for the year for the best photographs taken that were newsworthy. Uh, and uh, several years ago, uh, there was a, a really big scandal because uh, at least 25% of the entrants were disqualified because they had digitally altered their photos. Um, and, and these are supposed to be photojournalists, right? And so um, it's happening, you know, when we talked about the news media company environment and the pressure that that puts on journalists and all those different expectations and the 24-7 news cycle and all these things play into it, um, but, but it is a, a frustrating thing to think about. And how well can people spot digitally altered video? Um, and there are uh, a couple different uh, things to look at here. Uh, so I'll talk about the, the last three before I get into the first one here. So first of all, context. Um, digitally altered video for context means that you're not given the broader situation of where the video was taken or part of the video has been cut off to make it look like something is happening when you're missing other context. Um, so this happened when uh, the Washington Nationals visited the White House when President Trump was in office and there was a video that went around that made it look like uh, one of the players refused to shake the president's hand. Um, but in actuality, the full video showed that, no, he turned to hug his teammate and then he shook the president's hand. Um, or, um, you know, the, uh, um, we had talked about the, uh, the bad example of uh, Nick Sandman on the Washington Mall and the initial video that was released that made it look like he was, you know, standing menacingly over this, this Native American man. And um, when in actuality, the full context showed that the man had approached him and was, uh, you know, trying to um, instigate a, a situation. And so um, context is important. Splicing. Uh, splicing is where uh, people take parts from two different videos and put them together to make it look like they are one video. That's really easy to do. I can do it up in the memory lab. Um, and um, if you know how to set your timing and whatnot, it can look like you've got one continuous scene or perspective, um, when in reality, there are two different things put together. Um, uh, framing um, has to do with you know, the way that a camera is pointed at things and perspective and what they choose to crop out of uh, the lens view affects um, your perception of, of what's going on. Um, and the scariest one, unfortunately, is the first one, which are deep fakes. How many of you have heard that term before? 
deep fake. Okay. Not too many of you. OK, so this is good, um, at least for me to tell you about it. Um, so uh, deep fakes uh, put to work artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence uh, is able to run an algorithmic program uh, to, in effect, learn how to do something when it's given a structure. Um, all within the, the parameters of its programming, of course, but it can create video or audio footage that looks real. Um, they can make it look like a person said or did something when they weren't actually there or did or said those things. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Yep. Um, and so um, deep fakes are kind of scary because you'll see videos passed around on social media um, in which it's got some celebrity or some politician looking like they're doing something or saying something and, and it's actually created by a computer is they have taken actual video footage and they have carefully spliced together um, different aspects and the program has recorded hundreds of instances of that person's voice, all the different inflections and tones, and used it to create a fake audio track uh, of what the person is saying and, and then manipulated the, the virtual face to make it look like the person is saying that. And that's pretty scary because it, it can make you question reality um, in a sense. Um, and there are a, a couple really good um, places that you can go to um, learn some skills to combat deep fakes. Uh, the Washington Post has a really good tool that allows you to practice and uh, look at different things that you can, um, can spot with that. OK, so we're going to practice. But not looking at deep fakes, because that's, that's a, bit, a bit much. But um, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, are you sure. Saying, are you saying deep fake or deep face? Fake. Deep fake, yes. Uh, so let's examine some recent news media and social media and evaluate its status as news. Um, not whether it's important or not, but does this qualify as news? Uh, and one note uh, I would like to make is that some articles and content that would have made great studies could not be linked due to subscription gatekeeping of content. So I found some articles be like, oh, this would be great. Um, but you'd have to pay money to read them. So could not, could not link to them. So they unfortunately got excluded. Um, so first, we're going to take a look at this article from CNN. OK. Boris Johnson condemned over failures of leadership in Partygate report. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson was fighting to save his flailing premiership on Monday after a damning investigation uncovered multiple parties, a culture of excessive drinking, and a, quote, failure of leadership in his government while the rest of the country was living under strict COVID-19 lockdown rules. The long-awaited report by senior civil servant Sue Gray condemned, quote, a serious failure to observe the standards of government and said a string of mass gatherings were, quote, difficult to justify while millions were unable to meet their friends and relatives. It also revealed that the police are investigating at least 12 events, including at least two Johnson attended, and a third held in his flat that he previously told lawmakers did not happen. Um, OK, so let's start with the headline. Um, how, how's our headline as far as news go? Is it sensationalist at all? Yeah, he's already guilty. A bit, right? So, so it's, it's the assumption of guilt, right? Um, and um, not just the assumption of guilt, but assumption of character, right? And the use of the phrase party gate, right? Um, that's not used in the actual report, right? Um, ever since Watergate happened, um, it has been a tool of news media companies to try to designate something as a scandal. But that also tells you something about who they think you are, right? Because if you've never heard of Watergate or understand that suffix, um, you would wonder, what does that mean? Gate? What, what, what's going on here, right? And so um, you can tell a lot about who they think their audience is based on the inclusion of that word in the, the subject here. 
But looking at those first couple paragraphs, um, what, what's some uh, biased uh, or emotional language that you noticed? Flailing. Flailing premiership. Flailing premiership. Damning investigation. Um, multiple parties. Multiple parties. Um, excessive drinking. Okay, so. Um, yeah, they don't say it was by him. <laughs> right. And, and so here's, you remember, one of the things we do to be news literate is we ask questions. Okay, so when they talk about excessive drinking, whose standard of excessive drinking are we talking about here? Right. There are all sorts of stereotypes about that. Um, and so what does that mean? Um, or, um, Where are they drinking? Yeah, it, there's that too, right? Um, uh, okay, and so... Who's quoting, who's quoting the failure of leadership? Okay, yep. Yeah. So um, there are quotes, but the quotes are very short. Um, but uh, there is a link here. Let's see if it actually goes to the report. Um, nope, it goes to another CNN news article. So. <laughs> Uh, that doesn't help us at all. Um, what about up here? Uh, let's check here. Nope, that takes us to another CNN report. And so um, that's not helpful because we'd like to read the report for ourselves to see, well, is that what it actually said? Um, okay, uh, so here's interesting phraseology. Gray's report was heavily neutered due to a simultaneous police investigation but its general findings were strong enough to leave Johnson's leadership on the precipice. He insisted in Parliament that he, quote, will fix it, and pledged a number of relatively modest reforms of his operation, but faced calls from all quarters that he should resign and publicly lost the support of more of his own backbenchers. Okay, so you have to know what a backbencher is, right? That's not a term we use in America, even though this is a CNN you know, article. Um, and you can tell that there are very charged language in this paragraph, which, like you said, is like he's guilty, right? Um, and he's in a terrible position. Now, remember when we looked at um, Joseph Pulitzer and that start of sensationalist news in relation to government, it, we uh, quoted a, a, a news historian who said that he generated news that both um, caused and projected interest. Meaning that the way he presented it, because it was so entertaining, made people pay attention. But the way it was written made you think that this was something you should care about and that other people were already considering it important. Right? Um, and so I think you can see that here, mm -hmm. is that they're saying that this is a major thing and that this is how it is and this is what's going to happen um, and uh, possibly trying to create a self-fulfilling prophecy as it were um, if you can persuade people to agree with you then and you get them to think that well everybody else already does then eventually you might actually get that to happen which of course we saw when we looked at the steps of propaganda Okay, let's take a look at our next example. Twitter. Okay, this one will be fun. Oh, oh no, don't stop me now. Um, let's see if it'll let me do it. Will you let me go? Nope, it's not gonna let me. Huh. Okay, so what I can do, and this will be fun. Maybe. Okay. I'm going to go to open the hyperlink. Oh, come on. Well, that can happen for one of two reasons. Um, either it's been deleted, gatekeeping, right? Or um, uh, it's not liking the internet connection. So I will just. Uh, what was it about? I will briefly explain. Uh, so, first of all, it was in French. Um, uh, so if, if you can read French, that's great. Um, but um, it was from the um, uh, president of France, uh, Emmanuel Macron, um, and he was sharing the results of a report about uh, the growth of agriculture education in France. 
and said that this initiative that he had gotten going was a success because of the numbers that he shared in the tweet. Um, and so I think that's something that you could verify as far as you know, the numbers and, and learn more about that program and look it up and, and see what it did. Um, and maybe it's something you can be like, hey, we could really use that in our state or, or something uh, similar. Um, but whether you agree with this evaluation of whether it was a success or not, you know, depending on how much you know about the French economy or the French educational system, um, you know, that's something else that requires more questions. Okay, okay Fox News. UN, more than 100 former Afghan troops officials killed since Taliban takeover. Okay. The United Nations reportedly has received credible allegations that more than 100 former Afghanistan government officials, troops, and those who worked with coalition forces have been killed since the Taliban took control of the country in mid-August, despite assurances from the militant group that they would remain unharmed. The chilling revelations emerged in a report that UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez has delivered to the Security Council, according to the Associated Press. Quote, as I appeal to the international community to step up support for the people of Afghanistan, I make an equally urgent plea to the Taliban leadership to recognize and protect the fundamental human rights that every person shares, Gutierrez told the UN Security Council last week. Okay, how are we doing so far? Um, we, we saw a, a little bit of, of charged language here. Um, I think the, uh, the chilling revelations, right? Um, but uh, let's take a look. So there's a link here under the United Nations. Okay, nope, that doesn't tell us much. That just takes us to articles about the United Nations. Um, let's see, Afghanistan, same thing. No, they're not doing a very good job of giving us the actual source. Here we go. Okay, here we go. So this is the United Nations official transcript of the Secretary General. So it has a link directly to what he said as provided um, at that meeting. And so we can read it for ourselves uh, and, and see what his report is. And hopefully in that report, he would state um, how he got his information. And now of course, um, because of the nature of this topic, he might not disclose some sources because he doesn't want them to die. Um, we looked at last week um, statistics about uh, journalists that are imprisoned and have been killed across the world and how Afghanistan was the most dangerous country for journalists last year. Um, okay. Leroy, maybe yes. in that article, mm -hmm. three critical words. One is credible. Yep. One is allegedly. Yep. And the other is according to. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that means that we are receiving this information um, and the person who shared it um, that this news article uh, is talking about believes them to be credible. So then you have to think about, well, is the person who's sharing it credible and why do you think so? Um, and then the, an allegation means it's something that we haven't been able to prove yet, right? Uh, and then there's also the um, according to, meaning that, again, as we've talked about in previous weeks, most news that reaches us is at least secondhand. Right? It's passed through some other gatekeeper before it gets to us. That's an excellent point, Carl. Now, um, here's a point that we see that the 24-7 news cycle has definitely had an influence on is allegations is they no longer just report on the facts of a crime or a trial or the results of a trial, but before the trial maybe even gets underway, they put forward the allegations. And a lot of times using charged language, which is creating a court of public opinion. Guilty before proven, Guilty before proven innocent. Which in some other countries is not the case. That's not how their judicial system works. But here in the United States, that's a troubling thought. Um, because if news media persuades people to view a person a certain way, and then they're found innocent in a court of law of whatever crime they were charged with, 
they still have to deal with all the public opinion as well. Um, and and that's, um, that goes against that ethical standard we talked about, which is do minimal harm, right? Okay, up next, rooters. Okay. Pakistani media mogul acquitted of graft charges. Okay, so first of all, you have to know what a mogul is, right? In this uh, context. Lahore, Pakistan, January 31st. A Pakistani court on Monday acquitted the country's biggest media mogul of corruption charges over land acquisitions dating back three decades, a case that rights, rights groups said was brought in an effort to curb press freedom. After an almost two-year trial, the court in the eastern city of Lahore ordered the release of Mir Shakil Uraiman for lack of evidence, his lawyer Amjad Parvez said. There is no supportive material with the prosecution to prove involvement of the accused, the court said in its ruling. Arrested in March 2020 on charges of securing illegal property concessions from a previous government in 1986, Raymond was granted bail later in November that year. Raymond is the owner and editor-in-chief of Jiang Media Group, which publishes Urdu and English language newspapers and also runs the popular Geo News TV. New York-based Community to Protect Journalists and other rights groups said the prosecution of Raymond amounted to an attack on press freedom. Quote, it is the price you pay for taking an independent stance, Geo TV director news Rana Jawad told Reuters. He said Raymond was targeted to silence his group's critical reporting of the government. Okay, so think about where this article is going in relation to where the headline started, right? Does the author of this article have an agenda? It's an agenda you might agree with, but, but is it there? They went from reporting about the results of the trial to trying to create a causal link, which has not been proven, as to why the charges were brought, okay? Um, if we continue down a little bit here, okay. Prime Minister Imran Khan has long accused Raymond's media group of siding with his main rival, former two-time Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. Khan's relations with the media have become increasingly strained since he took office after an election in 2018. Opponents say he rode to power on the back of a crackdown on the media and his opponents by Pakistan's powerful military, which has a history of involvement in politics, a charge both the government and the military deny. Activists say the media crackdown since 2018 has left over 3,000 journalists and other media workers jobless. Okay, what questions do you have? I see numbers. I want to know where those numbers come from. It's sort of a cause and effect. They're saying one thing caused this and the effect of that. Mm -hmm. So there are, are accusations made in this article about the conduct of political and military officials. Um, but they're, they're just, re there should be attribution. And because they're, they're repeating the words of others but without telling us where that came from. And they're phrasing it in a way that makes it seems like this is general knowledge that everybody thinks this, right? It's well, like the word crackdown too. Right? Um, we don't live in Pakistan. How are we supposed to know if this is true? Um, especially because Reuters is an international um, news organization. Um, that makes me have questions about this is how can I verify this? What kind of research am I gonna have to do in order to find out what are the perspectives on this in Pakistan? What are people saying? Um, so again, was there an agenda? Okay, the Tokyo Reporter. Um, so this is what we call a crime newspaper. So they report exclusively on things related to um, Crime scandal and intrigue, as you can see right there. COVID-19 patient in serious condition turned away by 120 hospitals in Tokyo. 
A man in serious condition due to symptoms of COVID-19 was turned away by more than 100 hospitals last week, it has been learned, reports NHK. Earlier this month, the man, aged in his 50s and living in the capital, was recovering at home after testing positive for the novel coronavirus, which causes the disease COVID-19. However, his condition became serious after he developed breathing problems two days later. After he alerted emergency services, the ambulance was turned away by about 120 hospitals. Five hours later, he was admitted to Nippon Medical School Hospital in Bunkyo Ward. The number of people infected with the coronavirus who are recuperating at home rose to 17,356 in Tokyo as of Monday, a sharp increase of 11.4 times over a month ago. The situation at the Nippon Medical School Hospital reflects this trend, according to Dr. Shoji Yokobori, the director of the emergency medical center at the hospital. Quote, I have never experienced such a large number of requests for admission to the critical care unit at a time when, when beds are being so quickly filled, the doctor said. We have to consider the possibility that lives that could have been saved will not be saved. Unless we reduce the number of infected people, this situation will continue. On Monday, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government recorded 2,884 coronavirus cases in the capital, the 14th straight day that the daily figure exceeded 2,000. Okay. What do we think? Find it impossible the guy could have gone to 120 hospitals in a matter of hours. Hours, yeah. Let's take a look. Osaka, and so this links back to the original article, Osaka man in COVID-19, with COVID-19, waited in ambulance for a day and a half for admittance to the hospital. So that gives us some context, doesn't it? So if it was just a matter of hours, we'd be like, whoa. But he was in, a, in an ambulance for a day and a half. And so the ambulance was communicating with different hospitals and, and, and no one would take it. Um, so if we go back to the article we were looking at. So that was a great question to start with, right? That doesn't seem right. And, but they provided us with a link that gave us some better context. Um, do you see any emotionally charged language here? I saw a couple typos, but um, um, those, again, with the 24-7 news cycle have become more common. Um, I think this is pretty straightforward. Um, it provides us with the information. It doesn't evaluate that information. It doesn't say this is good or bad. It says this is what happened. Um, and it provides us with statistics, um, including an attributed source, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. So we can look that up for ourselves if we want. Um, so not too bad. Now, does that mean that everything on their site is this way? No. Um, but for this article specifically, um, it's pretty straightforward, and we could check into it more if we wanted. The Havana Times. Twelve years in prison for sharing opinions on social networks. Donald Margarato Alvarenga Mendoza's last Facebook post was a video of The Logical Song by British rock band Supertramp on Thursday, October 28th, 2021. 10 days later, on November 6th, he was arrested by Daniel Ortega's police, and on January 13th, 2022, one of the ruler's judges convicted him for allegedly inciting hatred and violence through Facebook posts and WhatsApp messages. Alvarenga, 56, is a former FSLN guerrilla fighter and was an Interior Ministry official in the 1980s. He is the first Nicaraguan opposition member convicted under the Special Cybercrime Law, or quote, gag law, and Law 1055, or quote, sovereignty law, both approved at the end of 2020. He was charged for the alleged crimes of subversion, disobedience, and rebellion at the level of conspiracy to affect national integrity. A review of Alvarenga's publications in recent months only show that the citizen is a fan of rock bands of the 70s and 80s as well as protest music. His only publications with political overtones were aimed at demanding the release of political prisoners and a call not to vote in the November 7 elections in which Daniel Ortega and Rosario Murillo 
gave themselves one more term after arresting the main opposition candidates, civic and political leaders, and canceling the legal status of opposition parties. Everyone in Chichigalpa, a municipality of Chinandega, knows that my dad is an opponent of the government, and they, opponents, share publications among themselves. As my father said at the time, I am not responsible for the publications or messages that are sent to my Facebook, because this is a free medium, commented Donald Enrique Alvarenga, son of the convicted political prisoner. The trial against Alvarenga lasted more than 12 hours and was held in a single day. It was in the hands of Rosa Velia Baca Cardosa, judge of the criminal district of Chinandega in northwestern Nicaragua, who argued that Alvarenga's publications, expressions, and posts incited hatred and violence. She also alleged that the citizen promoted meetings with the purpose of creating anxiety, instability, anguish, and desperation in the population of Chichigalpa. On January 18th, the judge initially imposed a sentence of seven and a half years in prison, but a day later she rectified it and raised it to 12 years. A sentence of eight years, quote, for the crime of undermining national integrity and conspiracy, and another of four years for the crime of spreading false news through information and communication technologies, according to Baca Cardoza's rectification order. Quote, some messages were found that I honestly don't see any problem with. In reality, I don't think that the things my father published on his Facebook page could be psychologically damaging to the population, said his son, Donald Enrique. The evidence against Alvarenga was the testimonies of seven police officers, some publications on his Facebook page, and some messages in a WhatsApp group. Norvin Cruz Ponce, Alvarenga's defense lawyer, said in an interview with the program Este Semana, broadcast on Facebook and YouTube due to the regime's censorship, that the judge did not take the inconsistencies in the evidence provided by the police and the public prosecutor's office into account. The defense attorney stated that during the trial, he asked the police officers if they had ascertained which victims were frightened by the publication that Alvarenga allegedly made, and if a professional had determined this emotional affectation. According to Cruz, the police officers justified this by saying they could not bring in, quote, half of the Nicaraguan population who were psychologically affected by the publication, to which the defense attorney explained, quote, it was not necessary to bring half of Nicaragua. It was enough to bring several people and demonstrate that they were emotionally affected through a legal medical opinion, which they did not offer. And there's more. Um, what do you think? First of all, have you heard anything about this before? No, right? Does American news media cover anything about the Nicaraguan, Nicaraguan dictatorship? No, right? Um, so what perspectives are missing, right? What is it that you're not learning about um, that maybe you do care about? Um, and uh, so the way that this information is presented, um, does the person have a perspective and opinion? I think so, right? Um, are they using very biased language to persuade you of that opinion? Not so much. I didn't see a lot of emotionally charged language. Um, I mean, it's clear that they have a perspective, but it's not sensationalist. Um, there's a lot of quotes with direct attribution. Um, and um, you can definitely tell that they have, expect you to have some background knowledge but they also provide little bits of explanation as well, right? Letting you know about places um, and so forth. Um, so you could certainly learn things from this article. Uh, whether you come to the same conclusion uh, as uh, the author or not, I don't know. But at least we know it's sharing information, right? Okay, we're almost out of time, so we're going to warp speed here. I'm going to take a look at the Egyptian Ministry of Foreign Affairs on Facebook. Okay, we're going to you. So, notice that each of the posts for English says unofficial translation. So they're giving us a heads up that maybe not exact. Um, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Semeh Shukri, 
the President-designate of the 27th session of the Conference of the Parties, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that Egypt hosts and chairs in November 2022, received today, February 2nd, 2022, a phone call from the Executive Vice President of the European Commission in charge of climate change issues, Franz Timmermans. Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson, Ambassador Ahmed Hafez, stated that the foreign minister during the call expressed appreciation for the extended cooperation between Egypt and the European Union in all fields and his aspiration to continue this cooperation on various levels. Minister Shokre also indicated that Egypt intends to build on what has been achieved during the last session of the conference in Glasgow and the momentum it resulted in to promote international efforts to confront climate change, especially with regard to mitigation, adaptation, and climate finance. Minister Shokre added that Egypt adopts an ambitious agenda for the next session of the conference, which includes increasing the country's nationally determined contributions related to reducing emissions and financing adaptation to negative impacts of climate change, with a special focus on the transition from the stage of pledges to the stage of actual implementation on the ground. The spokesman concluded his statement by referring to the foreign minister's emphasis that Egypt will adopt in its capacity as the incoming president of the conference, a comprehensive approach that takes into account the visions and priorities of the various parties. All right, what do we think? Pretty good. Good. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's obviously a press release, right? Look at what we are doing. So there is an agenda here. Um, and so the information itself is pretty straightforward, but who is sharing it and why are they sharing it? Um, there is a reason for that, right? It's not intended just to inform, but it's intended to cast a positive light based on an assumed audience, right? The Associated Press. Russia, US exchange accusations over Ukraine at UN. United Nations. Russia accused the West on Monday of, quote, whipping up tensions over Ukraine and said the U.S. had brought, quote, pure Nazis to power in Kiev as the U.N. Security Council held a stormy and bellicose debate on Moscow's troop buildup near its southern neighbor. U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield shot back that Russia's growing military force of more than 100,000 troops along Ukraine's borders was, quote, the largest mobilization in Europe in decades adding that there has been a spike in cyber attacks and Russian disinformation. Quote, and they are attempting, without any factual basis, to paint Ukraine and Western countries as the aggressors to fabricate a pretext for attack, she said. The harsh exchanges in the Security Council came as Moscow lost an attempt to block the meeting and reflected the gulf between the two nuclear powers. It was the first open session where all protagonists in the Ukraine crisis spoke publicly, even though the UN's most powerful body took no action. Okay, are we seeing some, some sensationalism here? Absolutely. Shot back, stormy and bellicose. Um, harsh exchanges, the gulf between, right? It's trying to paint this in very stark, it is either this or this terms trying to make it seem like there is a harsh conflict. Is this stoking the fire a little bit? Right? Um, and so we can clearly see that there is a perspective and an opinion going on here. Right? Okay, moving along. The Daily Saba. This is from Turkey. Okay. Recruited children expose horrors of life in YPG PKK captivity. Children who were deceived or abducted and taken to the mountains by the YPG PKK terrorist group have revealed the activities and brutal practices of the organization. A total of 15 children, including two Syrian nationals who were forcibly recruited by the terrorist group, have been defined as victims of human trafficking by Turkey's Immigration Management Directorate. Interviews with the children, aged 9 to 17 years old, revealed how they were deceived and persecuted by the YPG PKK terrorist group. 
A Syrian national who escaped from the YPG PKK group, which he joined at the age of 14, recalled, they, the terrorists, said, we will take you to a place in the Derek region, train you and send you back. You will return to your home again. After completing the training, we realized they have no intention to send us back. They wanted us to become guerrilla fighters and to forget about our families, he said. They told us that Turkey is our biggest enemy, he recalled, saying the terrorists also used psychological pressure to prevent anyone from leaving. Quote, I am very glad that I escaped. When I came back, there was a law of remorse. I was tried under the law of remorse, under the remorse law. The terrorist group's recruitment and exploitation of children in the conflict-hit country were also reflected in reports by the United Nations. The terrorists are given opportunities to confess and explain the ordeal they endured. This helps them gain some benefits from remorse that can ultimately lessen their level of punishment. Okay, what do you think? Is there a perspective here? Okay. What information is missing? Who are the terrorists? Who are the terrorists? And here is where we learn that this is that this is uh, a a Turkish government propaganda piece. Um, notice how they repeatedly refer to the YPG PKK as one terrorist organization. Turkey is one of only two countries that think that they are the same organization and that declares them both as terrorists. Most countries recognize that the PKK is a terrorist organization. They're a separatist group um, that wants to declare independence from Turkey and they use violence for the means. The YPG is a group of Kurdish guerrilla fighters who were fighting against the Syrian regime um, during their civil war. Totally different group. But Turkey just lumps them together. Um, and as you go down through the article, even though they keep saying YPG, PKK, there isn't any actual evidence that YPG is tied to PKK at all. Um, and on top of that, you notice some of that, um, that even though they said we saved these children, they still charged them with crimes. Mm -hmm. um, and the children said, you know, the terrorists wouldn't let us go home. But then later down in the article, it says that the government would allow them on special conditions to contact their families. So they're not sending them home either. Um, and so ask questions, right? Okay. And Spiegel International. This is a really long one, so we're just going to summarize. Um, this is an article about illegal logging by Chinese companies um, in Africa. Um, and so it, it goes into, whoa, we've got ads all over the place. Woohoo. Okay, combating mass clear cutting in Congo. Um, and so it's a very long article, lots of pictures, um, but this it would be an investigative piece uh, because this crew of journalists went down and they spent time in these villages um, and worked with the local villagers who are trying to catch these illegal Chinese loggers and document what they're doing and try to report them um, and the frustrations that they deal with when there's corruption and, and other things there. So, yes? Just lots of alliteration at first there, too. Um, yeah, combating mass clear-cutting in Congo. Um, things like that are designed to get your attention, right? Um, so there's obviously a perspective here. They're providing very interesting information. Um, there isn't anything much from the Chinese side of things. Um, but I wouldn't expect there to be. Um, but uh, you know, lots to look at there. So that brings us to the end of our practice. I hope that gave you an opportunity to think about and look at the type of questions that you ask as you're presented with news media. But I also want to return to that point of there are going to be people that you know or that you care about that you disagree with. And it's OK to disagree. Um, but, you know, arguing or trying to force people to, to come to another point isn't, isn't going to help. But teaching them to be news literate, just as you are learning and practicing to do, will help you both um, and allow you to maybe come to uh, a shared conclusion about a particular topic. You never know. Um, but thank you, everyone, for coming. I, I appreciate you being here. And um, that's all for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
job of pronouncing all those names. <laughs> that, that, is one, that is one thing I am good at. 